are many ethical dilemmas in healthcare, and the field of bioethics came into existence in the 20th century partly because of the vast expansion of medical technology. Patients who would have died in the past were able to live longer because of medical advances, but this meant they often had a lingering, suffering existence. Decisions about how to allocate new and scarce medical resources were common. Thus, during the mid-1950s, healthcare policies and laws were enacted to address some of these new issues, and the new field of bioethics was born. This presentation will first discuss some of the distinctions used in bioethics that can cause confusion and hinder ethical decision-making. Next, we will discuss three methods of justification in ethics. Finally, we'll look at ethics through the lens of a nurse. In his classic text, Practical Decision-Making in Healthcare Ethics, De Vetter explains several distinctions that should be used with caution or not at all because the distinctions can hinder ethical reasoning. The first distinction is between actions and omissions. Actions are doing something and omissions are not doing something. This distinction is commonly used when discussing the outcomes of removing life support from a patient. De Vetter explains that most people believe that since it's immoral to perform an action leading to a patient's death, they think of removing life support as an omission, not as an action. This is dangerous because it twists words. Removing life support is not just an omission of treatment, it is indeed an action. While some believe that omissions contributing to a death are easier to justify than actions contributing to a death, this manipulates language and should be avoided. The second distinction that should be used with caution is withdrawing versus withholding treatment. This distinction is problematic because it's not always easy to tell the difference between the two. Additionally, research has found that the decision to withdraw treatment is psychologically more difficult to make than the decision to withhold treatment. But ethically, it can actually be easier to justify withdrawing treatment than withholding it from the onset. A third distinction De Vetter cautions against is between ordinary and extraordinary means of preserving life. This distinction is not as commonly used as it was in the past, but it still warrants discussion. In the past, it was common to talk about this distinction as recognizing that although human life is an important value, ethical behavior does not require people to use extraordinary means to preserve it. Thus, it was morally acceptable for patients, families, or providers to withhold or withdraw extraordinary treatment, even if death was the result. It was not morally acceptable to forego ordinary treatment. You can probably recognize the obvious problem with this argument is that what is considered ordinary and extraordinary is not clear cut. The next distinction we'll discuss is futile versus effective treatment. This became an issue with the increased emphasis on patient autonomy. If a patient or family requests treatment that a provider deems inappropriate, the provider is being asked to act in contradiction to her professional judgment. Thus, this distinction can seem useful because once a treatment is determined to be futile, the provider does not have an obligation to provide it, even if it is the patient or family's wish. While this sounds helpful, a recurring theme is that the distinction between futile and effective treatment is just not always clear and objective. The last distinction we'll discuss is the difference of direct or intentional results and indirect or unintentional results. For example, De Vetter explains the direct and intentional result of an appendectomy is to remove the appendix. The indirect and unintentional results of an appendectomy is pain, trauma, and risks such as infection. De Vetter cautions against the distinction using the argument, we must be responsible for all known effects, not just the intentional ones. We must decide whether our action is reasonable, which must take into consideration both intended and unintended results. Take a moment to recall the five distinctions that De Vetter cautions against. How many can you name? So, what method do ethicists use to justify ethical and moral decision-making? With so many nuances and variables and so many ethical theories, is it even possible? There is, in fact, a disagreement about what methods to use to teach, practice, and research ethically, as well as disagreements about how to justify moral conclusions. Justification in ethical and moral decision-making means establishing a case or an ethical position by presenting sufficient reasons for it. 
The first approach to doing this uses a top-down or deductive perspective and emphasizes moral principles, rules, ideals, rights, and theories. Using this method, ethicists justify a particular judgment, belief, or hypothesis by looking at it under the scope of one or more moral rules, looking at the rules under general principles, or defending both rules and principles by appealing to an ethical theory. The second approach to doing ethics uses a bottom-up or inductive approach. This focuses on practical decision-making rather than on principles or theories. Ethicists who use this approach emphasize reasoning from particular instances to general statements or positions, using existing social practices, cases in moral tradition, experiences, and particular circumstances. A third approach integrates the top-down and bottom-up perspectives and is called reflective equilibrium or coherence theory. In this method, principles need to be made specific for individual cases, and individual cases need to be informed by general principles. To quote Beauchamp and Childress, equilibrium occurs after one evaluates the strengths and weaknesses of all plausible moral judgments, principles, and relevant background theories, incorporating as wide a variety of kinds and levels of legitimate beliefs as possible. Which approach resonates most with you? Finally, let's talk about how nurses make ethical decisions. Each individual nurse will make almost constant ethical decisions. When nurses are acting as part of the larger healthcare team, decisions are often made using a bottom-up approach, such as casuistry. This means they begin with relevant facts about a particular case and then move toward a resolution through a structured analysis. Nursing ethics is present in all nursing roles. Butts and Rich state that nursing as praxis means ethics is embedded in practice and all activities of nursing. Nurses should also use a top-down approach by first referring to the American Nurses Association's Code of Ethics for Nurses with interpretive statements and the International Council of Nurses Code of Ethics for Nurses. These guides serve as non-negotiable norms for the nursing profession and focus on patient needs. They are largely based on concepts from deontology and normative ethics. Thus, nurses use a combined bottom-up and top-down approach to ethical decision-making. Finally, when nurses do not agree with physicians, family members, or surrogates' decisions surrounding a patient's health care, it's important to recognize nurses are in an ideal position to suggest an ethics committee referral.